Ja, guten Abend. Welcome everybody. Ich möchte anfangs äh, ein paar Worte auf Deutsch sagen. Äh, die Ruth Noack muss äh, normalerweise, denke ich, nicht mehr groß vorgestellt werden. Ich möchte es dennoch tun. Äh, ganz kurz auch zu der Reihe Countdown zum Neubeginn einer Institution. Es geht ja um das Künstlerhaus, das äh, in etwa einem Jahr oder ein bisschen mehr vielleicht äh, wieder eröffnet wird am Karlsplatz. Das ist jetzt ein Ausweichquartier. Es geht darum, hier in dieser Veranstaltungsreihe das Künstlerhaus auch neu zu denken. Dazu werden und wurden Gäste eingeladen, die mit ihrem Hintergrund, aus ihrer Arbeit meiner Meinung nach nützlich sein können für Gedanken, die im Verein auch eventuell äh, Realisierung finden äh, im, im neuen Haus vor allem. Es gibt seit Februar diesen Jahres äh, einen künstlerischen Leiter, der Tim Voss, der leider heute nicht hier sein kann. Und äh, ja, also das Künstlerhaus wird neu gedacht. Wie das genau aussehen wird, wird wahrscheinlich noch warten. Man wird warten müssen bis 2020. Es gibt allerdings schon eine Veranstaltungsreihe im Frühling 2019, über vier Monate, haben und brauchen in Wien, wo viele Institutionen eingeladen werden und äh, einige Formate hier ausprobiert werden, die es, glaube ich, in dieser Weise in Wien noch nicht gegeben hat. Ja, die, äh, das ist die fünfte Veranstaltung in der Reihe Countdown. Äh, der Titel kommt aus einer früheren Reihe, Produktion und Schwesterfelder und Interviews, die ich mit äh, Gästen gemacht habe und da fiel auch dieser Begriff Lernprozesse einer Bildungsanstalt und ich dachte, das äh, ist äh, sehr geeignet, um wieder über bestimmte Fragen zu sprechen und dabei ist mir vor allem die Ruth Noack eingefallen. Ruth Noack ist äh, Lehrende, Autorin, Kuratorin, Viele kennen sie, die hier sind. Sie hat publiziert früher in Springerin, Texte zu Kunst, in Icon, mehrere Ausstellungen, auch in Wien kuratiert, sehr früh, 1995, Szenen einer Theorie. Dann eine Ausstellung, die, die, glaube ich, den meisten Leuten, die sie gesehen haben, noch sehr gut in Erinnerung ist, Dinge, die wir nicht verstehen, in der Generali Foundation, wo es auch politisch, um eine ähnliche Situation vielleicht nicht ganz so arg äh, ging, wie es heutzutage ist, also im Jahr 2000 mit der schwarz-blauen äh, Regierung. Und in dieser Ausstellung wurde versucht, äh, eine ästhetische Autonomie zu reklamieren, die sozusagen nicht äh, politisch vereinnahmbar ist, vielleicht kann man sagen, oder die Rolle, die politische Rolle der, der, der ästhetischen Autonomie untersucht. Eine wichtige Ausstellungsreihe, die Ruth Noack zusammen mit Roger Martin Bürgel kuratiert hat, war über die Regierung, about government oder on government, die in Barcelona, die auch in Wien in der Sezession eine, eine Station hatte, ein Programm davon, es war in der Miami Art, im Witte de Witt in Rotterdam, eine Ausstellung im Magba natürlich, da war ich auch mal, konnte das, diesen Teil sehen. Dann natürlich äh, Kuratorin 2007, Dokumenta 12, dann äh, 2012 Busan, Biennale Garden of Learning, im gleichen Jahr Not Rest for Conquering, eine Ausstellung mit Ines Dujak, die auch heute hier ist. 2015 Notes on Crisis, Currency and Consumption und äh, zuletzt äh, eine Ausstellung Sleeping with the Vengeance, Dreaming of a Life, äh, die jetzt im Sommer, glaube ich, in Prag stattfand und zurzeit in Peking. Ach, da, ja, dann Peking, aber da ist okay. sie auch schon wieder abgebaut. Okay, ja, sie äh, ist eben auch Lehrerin, äh, eine der letzten Stationen war das Royal College of Art in London, wo sie Curating Contemporary Art Programm geleitet hat. Sie war dann auch in Amsterdam im Dutch Art Institute 2015. 
ja, hat eben viele Texte veröffentlicht, äh, zuletzt auch über Sanja Ivekovic, ein Buch. Ähm, ich habe ein Interview heute kurz noch im Netz gesehen, äh, da geht es auch um Vermittlung, um, um, um Edu Edukation und da äh, fragte die Interviewerin, was verstehst du unter Kunstvermittlung und die Ruth antwortete, Kunstvermittlung sollte eine Aus ein Aushandlungsprozess zwischen verschiedenen Parteien und den involvierten Objekten sein. Nur dann, wenn alle beteiligten Akteurinnen, Menschen und Institutionen dabei lernen, ist es Kunstvermittlung. Und auf die Frage, warum zeitgenössische Kunst vermitteln, sagt sie, es gibt einen Unterschied zwischen Vermittlung, Mediation und Vermittlung, Bildung, Education. Letzteres interessiert mich mehr. Oft ist zeitgenössische Kunst Teil von spezialisierten Diskursen, es ist nicht davon auszugehen, dass potenzielle Betrachterinnen diese kennen. Zumindest sollten Vermittlerinnen, Kuratorinnen, Institutionen es den Betrachterinnen ermöglichen, zu verstehen, dass dies so ist und zugleich deutlich machen, dass Kunstvermittlung oder Bildung oder Spezialisierung nur eine von vielen Möglichkeiten sein könnte, um ein Kunstwerk zu verstehen. Ja, heute geht es um das Museum in der Schule. Und ich würde die Ruth bitten, mit ihrem Lecture zu beginnen. Und wenn, wenn sie zu einem Ende kommt, würde ich gerne ein paar Worte über Marcel Resende sagen. Danke. Also Christian, erstmal vielen, vielen Dank, dass du mich eingeladen hast. Ich zähle die Einladung, nachdem ich aus dieser Stadt nach 20 Jahren Anwesenheit weggegangen bin, Aufgrund eines Jobs, nicht weil ich die Stadt nicht mochte, ich kann die Einladung an einer Hand abzählen. Deswegen zähle ich noch. Ähm, also es ist die dritte in zehn Jahren. Ich freue mich deswegen ganz besonders, dass ich hier bin. Ähm, ich finde auch sehr wichtig, dass ähm, über dieser, Zeit, dieser Zeitraum der Renovierung benutzt wird, um nachzudenken. Ähm, allerdings trage ich, glaube ich, hier ein bisschen Eulen nach Athen, beziehungsweise viele von den Anwesenden kennen, worüber ich rede. Das habe ich so nicht erwartet, aber ich freue mich, in Gespräch zu kommen. And I'm especially happy to have next to me Marcelo Hesenji, whom I learned a lot from him and uh, and we live quite close by now and so we have a communication with each other and it's but he's also very busy so this is also an occasion to be able to have a conversation and um, 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 your vita will be read after my talk oh it doesn't so, matter yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what christian oh. what christian said I'll start by showing a short clip. I want to build a museum in a school. Why? It's an idea that grew over a long period of thinking about and experimenting with the relationship of art and audiences. Now, when I mention this to people, they say, ah, yes, I've heard about this. This is because there, this is, there's this museum that's making a symposium or that. 
um, school that is showing an exhibition. But, um, and the reason that people recognize this is because, um, as, as you all will know, there has been a pedagogical turn within the art um, world, the art business. Uh, I think the prevalence of lecture performances is um, also due to this. Um, so you have uh, artists who are creating schools, you have institutions who are suddenly creating school, schools, not just alternative institutions, also Tate Modern, for instance, has an academy. Um, you have exhibitions about school and you have symposia and there are a lot of curators and institutions that are actually looking back at utopian models of school and utopian models of education and actually we have someone here who became well known for this because he made a project of extending and I hope we will talk about yeah. this, ex changing a museum into a school that actually cost him his job <laughs> in the end. Um, and, but I think that when I'm talking about a museum and a school, I'm talking about something else, slightly else. Um, and maybe um, one of the reasons why it's a bit different is because there is, in fact, a difference between school and education. A cynic might describe this as a simple difference in position. When a pra practice comes out of the field of art education, a field with relatively little symbolic capital, or it used to have little symbolic capital, this is also changing right now, it has a harder time to gain substance institutionally than when artists and curators adopt it, and then quickly something is called a school. And I'm showing you this, um, this work by um, Gerwald Rockenschaub that we showed at Documenta 12 in 2007. This was a kind of polemic intervention into, these, into this discourse around this question of combination of school and art and art institutions. We had called for these kind of educational islands and he, and they were, consider, they were really catered towards conversation they were supposed to be that, uh, for uh, a situation where people can have a conversation while in the presence of artworks. And Rockenschaub um, cut through that quite polemically by putting into this very classical um, a sculpture that re is representing a very classical situation with the school board and a very frontal situation. Funnily enough, if some of you might remember when Gora and Godard were making her, her were in their Zigavatov um, group phase of making films that were supposed to intervene directly into politics, they called the screen a blackboard. So they had this idea that the screen would actually be somehow an educational tool. Um, Education at Documenta 12 also play, was a leitmotif, so it was one of three pillars of the whole exhibition, and we had a quite uh, advanced um, art education aspect to the exhibition. It, we co considered, as curators, we considered art education as part of the exhibition proper, not as something that comes after the exhibition. Um, so um, that was, when it really became clear that as curators we were interested in this, but in its radical Paulo Freire sense, um, our Roger Martin Bögels and my exhibitions, the early ones that I did with him, now I'm working without him, but the one early ones were very much driven by um, this interest um, in thinking about this relationship between art and audience in an educative way, not in the mediating way, because we were very com um, convinced that the co um, complex and possibly even very abstract art had a stake in political change. If we somehow managed to bring it across or to bring it to an audience, transgressing the limited and franchised art professionalized crowd. 
So we started early on dealing with this. This is midway through this process. Um, and uh, an image from a school in Barcelona, a high school, where we actually installed in their um, sports hall. And But you see here still a teacher talking about artwork, in this case, Dirk Schmidt's um, series uh, about a, refuge, a boat of refugees that was most probably shot down by the Australian military um, guard, uh, the guarding the borders of Australia in 2000. So he's talking about that to students and they're listening. Um, Later on, we learned a lot from these, these experiments and at document at 12, uh, we tried to turn around this relationship and so um, uh, trained 50 high school students over a period of one, we one year in weekly workshops to develop their own exhibition tours for adults. So we tried to change this relationship and when um, these students actually made a public discussion um, and they were asked, so did you really enjoy the art? They said, well, actually, we enjoyed the subject position. We enjoyed having a voice and performing a subject. So they were more interested in the power relations than actually in the mediating of art. Um, because it is a position that is conventionally resolved, reserved for adults. Um, here you see them... Um, performing as guides. Uh, the issue that arises, me, arises for me most pressingly when I start picturing children as agents of the kind of public sphere that we call a museum is that we must acknowledge in a radical way our own relationality to children. Instead of compartmentalizing the child as either client or free agent and think about how, um, and think about how to educate the child or leave it be, we need to ask what changes in us or what needs to change when we attempt to recognize the child. On the other hand, if we picture the complicated and conflicted relationality of children and adults and admit that we would be nothing without children, we would simply not be without children, we could begin to do justice to children and to ourselves. A museum that does this will never be the same. The question is, would such museums still yeah. be? I don't claim that my museum in a school would have the answer to this question. But for me personally, it was a practice-based research so far it was, which might lead us in the right direction of answering this question. Or at least I wanted to find out whether it would be lead us in the right direction. So my primary motivations uh, for making this museum of, um, of uh, in a school were two. The one I already talked about a little bit, this idea that uh, I would like to engage with children in a situation where they have some agency and for this agency to happen in the face of art, there needs to be some kind of sustained discussion. It can't be something that is event-based or even workshop-based. Um, so it can't also be play or something that we just give the children for an afternoon. So if, in order for them to gain some agency, they also need to gain some expertise. And this is not something that is, should be mediated to them, but something that they can self-learn, and if they want to. And so I thought we'd need a different model from the one that is the state art education or private art education that is around. Um, I also thought it would be interesting to bring this into this everyday environment, to bring art in this every... I mean, that's an idea that we already had in the 70s, but I think it's been lost a little bit, and I was interested in trying this out again. The other motivation was coming from the art part, which is actually that an artist and several artists of my generation said to me in the recent years, stop the world, I want to get off. 
I want to continue doing art, but I don't want to do it for this art business. I don't want to do it for the art world, and, but I wouldn't know how else to do it. And there is no space where to do this, where to come visible, where to have a discussion. So um, I was really seriously starting, starting to think about this. You know, how can we create formats in which this makes sense to make art? Because for me, it doesn't really make sense in most of the places where I do come across art. So I started out um, trying this out, and I tried it out in a very ephemeral way because um, of funding situations mostly, because I didn't want to apply for money, because then I would be again in this module of art education where you have to do certain things or legitimate your practice in a certain way that it was exactly how I didn't want to legitimate it. So instead, um, the first, first museum and school that I tried out was um, upon um, um, invitation of Anja Schäfer, who is a theatre uh, director who is working and has been working a lot with young people um, in schools. And um, she was making a summer program that was um, actually invited by a primary school in Kreuzberg, where I also live, um, because they are interested in um, two things. They're interested in t making t in other than school ties, authoritarian ties to the community, which has a in that area a majority of migrants. But on the other hand, they're also interested in using the space of the school because it's empty most of the time. Schools are empty most of the times, and it's quite ridiculous that you have this empty space in the, in the middle of a populated space. So they said, how can we, you know, do this and they made a summer program and um, so this school is called Nürting Primary School and one of the activities was my museum in the school and I invited artists to work, mostly artists to workshop with me and partially also with children but what mostly we were discussing. So these are the artists. Um, to, to discuss um, what form such a museum in a school might take on and what would make sense to them. Um, we realized quite quickly on, early on that um, it would be too difficult without budget actually to produce art or to show art that's somehow existing, display it. And we worked with a store instead with maps that we found in the cellar, unused maps. There, some of them are not politically correct. Some of them are just, they're not using these media anymore. And we made an installation with them and um, also talked and workshop with the kids about what's on these maps. Um, and then we also workshopped with adults around this. And, and the topic of this workshop, for instance, that you see here is really about what does it mean to engage differently than the way we think we should be doing this with an object in a space. So what we found out, this was the summer, and what we found out is that there are a number of problems um, that need to be solved when you're doing something like this. And these are not necessarily the problems that are the problems when you're doing evaluation of these pro progress um, of these things. There are other questions asked, so you don't really get at these problems. One. The, one of the biggest problems is that there are the institutional logics of a museum or an art exhibition and a school are very, very different, especially, and sometimes even contradictory, especially in terms of timing. Um, there's even in schools that are quite free in their planning, there's still a certain set of rules on how things should be enacted, and that is almost impossible to change or intervene in. And I think that we we'll have something to talk about in this also later on because it also pertains to museums and trying to change a museum. There is a, you know, this is just the logic of timing. It doesn't even have to do with people not wanting to change or being politically against it. Then there are certain aspects that need to be overcome, certain problems that have nothing to do with big problems, they're small problems, like who's got a key to a room? You can spend so much time dealing with that. Um, 
But there's also something that we were now asked by the director, and Anja Sheffer was asked by the director of the school to do this, and there were kids coming and workshopping with us and making this museum in a school. But um, we left out the teachers and the parents. If you're really gonna be serious about this, you need to somehow find a way to, to deal with the teachers, which is very, very hard and to deal with the parents, which is easier but often forgotten about, about neglected. So in a certain way, what, what I was doing in Nürting had a kind of problem in it that what I was aiming at is a, lot, a sustainable institutional structure, but the way I was researching it was through an almost event-based workshop-like um, modus. Um, and I repeated this, but in a bit longer term, in Salvador da Bahia. And um, in order to do this museum in the school there, I, I took uh, opportunity of a residency that I had for, um, and I worked for two months there preparing the museum in the school, and then another three weeks doing the museum in the school there. Um, I, in Salvador da Bahia, I worked uh, mainly with two places. One of them you see here, it's a, actually a museum in a comunidad. Are you all aware of this? Do you know the term comunidad? It's what we here in Germany or, or Austria or Europe like to call slums. And if we're politically correct, we call it informal cities. But the self-definition is actually community. And this is a, a comunidad called Plataforma. Um, and it's not in the outskirts, but it's not also, also not in the center of Bahia. And um, this is um, actually a private initiative by someone who realized that in order to survive and continue working, doing the work he's doing in the, in the community, uh, he needs to somehow focus on beauty. And so he started a collection of art that is produced in this community. Um, and you see here one of the um, installations in this museum. So um, there, in this museum already there is a school, so it's the other way around. You have a museum and this museum also has a school. But aside from the school, which has a fluctuating, fluctuating number of students from 1 to 20, and they also um, educate a lot of schools that come to the museum. So they're, um, they're having as pract uh, the d different kinds of practices of art education and education within this museum. And here you see a school doing a workshop, uh, school kids doing a workshop there. Um, so I invited young artists to come. We talked a lot, but then I invited young artists to come and work with this museum. And here you see them workshopping with the teacher of the school, uh, Vilma, and a translator who was helping enabling this because um, a lot of people in Salvador but Bahia don't speak English and I don't speak Brazilian and the artists also didn't speak Brazilian. So um, these artists who were working with the school decided that they would abandon the concept that I had and instead do something that is helpful to the museum, which is make a journal, which you see there on the below, in Portuguese um, for, the, for the school. So they said, okay, we see, we now put our, our service, um, we took, put our craft in the service of the school, and it was their own decision to do so. The other school, okay, so another thing that came out of it, sorry, I'll go back here. So you see this is a display, it's actually one of the more ordered displays in the museum. Often there's no, there's a lot of dust in the museum, often there's no electricity, so there are places that are quite um, like weird archives, or even look a bit like abandoned archives. Um, and I thought then very much about what can I do, be, do as a kind of service to this place, which I admire very much and got a lot of, which actually also inspired me a lot. Um, 
and I decided that um, I would make an exhibition. I would take one of the artists, works from one of the artists in this museum and actually borrow from this museum and put them in another space in Bahia, which is actually a space which was at that time close to the public and was open for the public during the show. And it's a quite a seminal place, um, a, a building by uh, architect Lina Bobaji. And um, the reason that this space is closed has to do very much with power in the city. The interesting thing is, so I made um, um, this exhibition um, by an artist called Carioca. And, um, and uh, it was the first time that people from Plata Plataforma ever came to this place. So um, here you see Gino and Vilma. Gino is the director of the Museum and Plataforma, Vilma the teacher. Um, and it was the first time that community came even to this place, which is in the center of town. And they were actually commenting on this, that actually the center of town is not for them. The second place I worked with was, was a primary school in a working class district, but a working class district that is quite well functioning and taking care of um, its people. Um, and I got the contact uh, to this school through this group of people who are artists from, um, young artists from Bahia. So the two months that I spent um, preparing the Museum of School was mostly spent in situations like this, just talking, um, also teaching each other. They were teaching me a lot, They're not just about Bahia, but um, about many things, history and so on. And I was um, telling them, giving them, you know, lending them my expertise. And we had lots of meetings like this. And then at some point they said that there's a school that they're very interested in. They would like to use this occasion to they would like to use this occasion to somehow um, engage with the school. So it was basically they who decided that this was a school that we should work with. Um, and this is an interesting, so it's in this working class um, uh, area called Alto da Pomba. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, the school was actually run by feminists feminists. And these feminists are very, in Brazil, are very family oriented at least when they're not in Sao Paulo and Rio, um, because family is so, it's a, such a patriarchal society so that it's really important if you wanna do something for women to really consider the family and that's why they're also doing the school and the school already had a 30 year history of being run by feminists and they had a, um, they had a laundry where women were working and the school, it all belonged together and um, so we started, this is a picture from that school. We started meeting. First time we tried to meet the director. This was after a long process of mediation. She let us wait four and a half hours. So we're waiting in the school for four and a half hours until she comes. Um, so again we met and we met many times. Here you see two of the meetings. And basically they said, why do you want to do this? Why should we be interested? And it was a lot of, um, basically they, they also agreed to do this because they were interested in the young artists from Brazil. So because the young artists from Brazil said, we want to do this, they agreed. But then they stipulated and they said, okay, but we don't just want you to bring in any art. We want you also, we want artists to come and do workshops with the kids, and we want them to be about gender, because gender is an issue. And I had learned from Ines, who's sitting in the back, that um, when we tried to do another workshop in um, the school f in Germany that I talked about, that uh, maybe to, to address genders head on with kids is not a good idea because you'll end up with a lot of stereotypes. Um, and so instead we talked about shape shifting. So we, um, the workshop was about shape, shape shifters. And um, uh, so we are, you know, we, we really discussed all of this with the teachers, with the director for a long time, and then actually the workshops happened and the, 
and we had at the end of the workshops a little exhibition and here you see the text written about it and here you see one of the artworks in action. It's an artwork by a Turkish, young Turkish artist, Gyakim, um, Baha Gyakim Yalim. And um, Gyakim had started to be very interested in the, in the history of this school and had started to research the old feminists who founded the school, who were not of much interest to the kids, and he thought, but this is a really important history, how can I make this history visible for the kids? And he started making this, um, this game, and then it was played. Here, here you see the kids playing with it. But there were a lot of different shape-shifting workshops, so it wasn't just um, one thing that, that happened. And here you see one of the students actually guiding through the documentation of this. It ended with a symposium where we tried to ref also represent what we'd done, but also discuss and reflect it, because I was also very, very interested in finding out whether this had been helpful for people or not. People said it was helpful, but as you can imagine, the moment I left and the little money that I had brought had, uh, was gone, um, th this thing died again. It was not sustainable. They, the young artists tried to continue to work with the school, but it was it was sustainable only as an event, not as a, an, as as something that a practice that is continuing without the kind of money support that you would need to to really enable this. Um, nevertheless, the uh, um, symposium was quite a, um, uh, quite a success, and again happening in Kwachi, um, this building by Lina Bobaji, which actually then also meant that um, the school kids went there for the first time. We paid for buses and lunches so that they could come, and they went for the first time into this, this kind of what outside of Brazil is considered like core of a kind of culture that has to, that also art can, artists can identify with, but that is basically not accessible normally to the kids. Um, because it's closed, but also because even if it was open, they wouldn't go there. They don't go there. They don't, unless it's a capoeira class, they don't go to the center of the town. So, um, despite the slightly contradictory nature of enacting an ephemeral museum in a school, we learned much. Um, and I was happy that at least the, while we were discussing this, the activities seemed to make sense to the local stakeholders. Yet, for the children to, and artists to gain real agency, real agency, a sustainable institution will have to be set up. Eventually, the children might not only use this museum as spectators, but join the core activities of, of a museum, taking care of objects, exhibiting, mediating them, and yes, I in a future museum institution that I plan actually to establish at some point, um, I would like to invite children to form a selection co committee for the purchase of artworks, jointly owned by the school and the museum, or owned fully by the school, but the museum taking care of them in the school. The reason for that is simple. It's this term, economic democracy. I realized at some point that um, basically we think, you know, we might mediate work and we might do workshops for kids in school and also maybe disenfranchised kids, but when it comes to collecting and owning, it's quite clear that this is still a question of white privilege. And I realized that um, to enable kids to start collecting, even, you know, collecting and also think about that is also possible um, about collecting for public or semi-public institution, like a museum in a school, would also be a way, and serious collecting, I'm really talking about jury meetings, about learning about the works, discussing the works and so on, would also be a way of um, allowing them to understand that this is something they can do. Um, so this is not about just saying, okay, no one should be collecting art, why should, um, 
people own art, but about saying who's actually participating in this psych economic cycle. And the term that is used for that is, by the way, and is, um, I mean, there are people thinking about this in, not in terms of, in relation to art, but in relation to other forms of participating in economy. So obviously this is conceived as an emancipatory project, but no emancipatory project can truly succeed unless its initiators seek to understand their own position of power and desire within the process. And my, my desire is still a curatorial desire, which is to see works of art make sense. And my position of power is to gain some agency myself, not so much as a broker, but as someone who is creating something. And from in this I take inspiration from the kids who during the symposium decided to treat us to a spontaneous to a spontaneous song that they invented at that moment. Just to say that this happened one, uh, two years ago, and then I got very exhausted. I, of course, I wasn't making money in, during all of this, and uh, I think that the next step really would be to try to find um, a way to set it up for real in a school. And um, I need to regain energy before I can do that. Thank you for this talk. Uh, when I invited Ruth to this talk for Vienna, she said uh, she would c come to Vienna with pleasure, but she wants to talk to Marcel Rizenje. And I said, okay, if you prefer to talk to uh, a special guest, I don't know. Yes, please ask him. And so he accepted also to come here. And I, of course, uh, had to look up who, who is Marcelo Rizende. And I, I, I said, uh, I found uh, he, he's a, a, a co-director from an archive, uh, which uh, will be uh, open next year, I think, in Dresden. 22? 20, 20, 20, 21. 21. Oh. So some, in some years. So it's an arch archive of avant-garde with one uh, million and five hundred thousand objects, I think, of the... Yes, and uh, I said, oh, what did he do before? And uh, I found out he is a researcher, critic, I think a, a novelist also. Uh, I was a poet, yeah, 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 writing about Arno Schmidt, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, he was the director of the Museum of Modern Art of Bahia, and I think you met them here, there, also. Uh, you worked together there a little? I'm going to tell you. Yes, it's okay. Time. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, maybe I recite uh, some words of Pablo La Fuente, who made a workshop in this museum, oh. and he said, the Mamba, Salvador, the Museum de Arte Moderna de Bahia, under the direction of Marcelo Rezende, the meeting host, comes across as a fluid institution. The office space is also the exhibition space, the reception, discussion, and presentation space. Other places in the museum have specific functions, but their use and occupation appears in principle open. The fluidity of space is meant to allow for a fluidity of relations. Cooking and eating together with the museum staff was a literal exchange of fluids while conversing with each other and among the staff was perhaps its metaphorical version. Yes, please go on. <laughs> Thank you, good evening. Um, 
it's really nice to be here and talk to Ruth. I'm really glad for this invitation and also to be in this moment that I'm here um, in an institution that's in the moment of transition somehow, um, that has the chance of reinventing itself. And this is also quite exciting and a possibility for an institution. So after what Ruth was talking to you all about her experience, about this, um, let's say, connections, interconnections between these two institutions, um, the museum and the school, um, I was thinking that maybe could be interesting to give it to you a kind of uh, context about these interconnections, let's say. So, why the museum in this in the school? And in another inter interesting question, why the school in the museum? And when I'm, when I'm talking about the school in the museum, I'm not talking about this classical point of view of the museological institution, like the pedagogic program, or the kids' corner uh, and the exhibition, but something more, more ambitious. So it could be interesting if I give to you the context of this place that uh, Ruth was talking to you about it, and, and that she went there, met those people, and what, 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 what was happening there? And why it was interesting to ask him those questions about the museum and the school, and the pedagogical level, and art in this specific place. So to give you a, 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 a short historical context, this place was the first Brazilian capital. It was the place that the Portuguese came for the first time. So it's the, it's the ground zero of the Brazilian colonization, let's say. And at the same time, it's a very crazy place. And, and, and a marvelous place. Stephen Zweig wrote some very interesting uh, um, texts about when Zweig has decided to, 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 to go to Bahia. Anyway, and during the Brazilian modernization in the 50s, two major things happened in that place. The first one was the inauguration of a new model of a school. It was in 1950. So this place was called Scola Park the park school. And just to, to be, um, to go a little far about it, this project of the park school was created by a man named Anísio Teixeira. So Brazil has three major educational creative minds. So uh, you have Anísio Teixeira, you have Darcy Ribeiro, and you have uh, Paulo Freire. So this man, Anis Teixeira, he went to the United States in the 1920s, and then he to study, and then he has this contact with this um, educator of the uh, North American culture. Of course, that I'm not going to remember the name of him. Um, John Dolne, Doe, I don't know. Uh, yeah, Doe, yeah. So he went there to study, and 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 it was part of the group of Doe. And, and it was quite interesting because Doe was giving classes about how we should educate the artistic sensibility of a human being not to give this formal education, but how can you bring this educational sensibility? And though and after this was invited to be part of the first uh, 
board of the Museum of Modern Art in New York in the 30s. So the connection starts really, but anyway, and Isu Teixeira decided to come back to Brazil. And this group that was the American group that stayed in the United States, they took the lessons, but they started thinking about that this, it, to educate the artistic sensibility should be done among adults. And they and it was the group that created the Black Mountain College. And Lizio Teixeira has decided to return to Brazil with another idea, that this process should be made among kids and not adults. And then he created the Park School. The Park School was a, a public program, and the idea that every school in Brazil should be a park school. And the park school was like, they're still there in Bahia, but not in the original program. But it was a place that to, the idea of working was, was really important. So uh, the kids, they were doing things with their hands, not only about theoretical classes, but doing things. It was a place for work. He created a space in the school named Socialist Room, a socialist space, and that everyone in the school, the workers or the students, could go there and do whatever they feel like to do. The school has a, had a radio uh, uh, inside the school that the students could talk to everyone to listen to. So this was the mode of Park School. Then, four years, uh, no, nine years after the inauguration of the park school, that, uh, when the project started to, to, to come up, Lino Bobardi, the one that made this building that uh, Ruth was showing to you, that's closed in, in Bahia, one of the, the, her projects in Bahia, she created the Museum of Modern Art. And they start to have a intellectual relationship, Anizio Teixeira and Lina Bobardi. So for him, the school should be made by an artistic process somehow. And she will start to think that if, if this is true, why not then the museum should take the place of the, have a stronger educational position in society. And then she created the Museum of Modern Art as a museum school. And once again, the project was not about giving lessons about art history. So it was a place to work. So she created a series of workshops. And then I, I became director of this museum and in 2012. And just uh, I'm telling you this just to, to explain why I had access to the archive of this museum that was never organized, so we decided to organize it. It was just a collateral thing. So uh, in, the, in researching the archive of this museum, we start to, f to find some letters that she wrote to herself. So she had this idea that she needs to write what the thoughts that she had, that she was having, and, and then we found some pieces of the history about this interconnection about the school in the museum. And then she left a kind of, a, and then she started asking questions to herself, like, okay, if you want to go in this direction, we need to have some, trying to find answers to some Aristotelic questions. Why is necessary to teach if you are in a museum? Why? Second, you in, who you intend to teach exactly? Where? What was the goal? And then she started to have this kind of uh, self uh, uh, questions. And, and then from this, she started to develop um, 
blueprint about how the museum, this artistic institution, should be. So in the original blueprint, you have, it's very interesting, you have a straight line like this, and then you have in the left side a biennial. So the museum should organize a biennial. And then you start to, to, to go to the right side, and then you start to found the collection, three different kinds of exhibitions, uh, and you have around the idea of 23 different schools inside the museum. So you're talking about practical things like design or I don't know, arts and crafts or or scientific discussions and etc. And then she start to take the model of the park school. And ho how was the model? The model was like this. To teach someone, it was necessary that these lessons should be close to the human experience of someone, not only a theoretical one. So, as an example, in the classes of chemistry, there was, there was a, a, always two teachers. One teacher is the, is the professional one that came from the university, that has his diploma. And the other one was the baker of, on the streets, the guy that was making bread every day to everyone. And they, they together, they start to give classes about what chemistry was about it. So these, they, these schools, they start to be structured like this inside the museum. And then you could start asking questions like, okay, but how, what, what was the position of the collection, the position of the artists, and etc. And then she also, in one of the original documents from 1960, one year after uh, the inauguration of the museum, she said, this is really not important. Because this place, this museum of modern art, is using the word museum because we can, you, you cannot find a, a better way of explaining this place. So, this place of ours should be called a movement in history. So it was really, it was really, um, it was a moment that the Brazilian society started to understand. It, it was 50 in the beginning of the 60s, late 50s, that we we start we could have two choices. One was to to just follow the Western um, organization of things, meaning Western art history, Western school, the European model or North American model. Or the country could start to, to have a new kind of experience that was to find their own answers. And then you have not in Bahia, not a Brazilian, version of a museum of modern art, but you have a Brazilian museum of modern art. That was quite a different thing. So when, when Ruth arrives there, it, it, and this is, is really interesting because if you go to, to, to this place and try to find the traces of this um, short story that I'm trying to, to tell you now, it's going to be very hard. To, to, to grasp this. Because this information, because of the, the, the dictatorship in Brazil, all this knowledge starts to disappear. The park school is there, but, but the park school is forbidden to follow the original program. The Museum of Modern Art was there, but the museum started to, once again, imitate a classical museum. So, but at the same time that this knowledge is totally almost invisible, there's this kind of, uh, how can I describe this? 
involuntary memory of this. And then if you start to dig things around you, you will start to find this kind of a connections that would start to, to, to find there. So I'm, I'm, t I'm telling this because I was, uh, when I was seeing this image and etc., I would say, yeah, maybe for, for you to, to watch in this could, could sound as a kind of a exoticism or, or, or um, much more a social work than, than uh, artistic work or curatorial work. So, but it's not like this. Because one of the, the main goals of these two radical projects, the school and the, the park school and the museum school, was to abolish this kind of a hierarchy. The artistic work is a social work. The social work can be artistic work. And so it goes on and on and on like this. So, Yes, this is also what I found so is, um, amazing about the Acervo de Lage that I showed you, the, um, the museum in the Comunidad. It's not that there is a museum in the Comunidad, but that the fact that if you're in this museum and you're sitting there, the whole work starts to make sense from that point. So you start to reread everything from that point. And that hasn't happened to me in many places. So exactly this kind of, it's not that art then can also be social work or social work can then also be art, but that art is different yeah. and it's truly art. And it's not just, you know, a social work covering as art, yeah. but that the kind of criteria that you're using to think about art and think about artistic practice as an, a contemporary practice change. And this is what this museum has ma managed to do, and that you know maybe is a, in in a kernel what was supposed to also happen in the Mamba, mm -hmm. but then was covered over and yeah. is now lived in this place. Yeah. So yes, let's say when when you when you start to think about this idea that this um, categories that we used to use in our hands or when you used to organize an institution like pedagogical sector, artistic sector, curatorial sector, or, or, or things like this. So what happened when you start to work from a perspective that you start to abolish these borders and what an institution can become in the end. So this is what's a bit of the meaning, like, I, 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 I was, a, I was mm, in the time that I was working there, I was a bit obsessed with these histories and, and reading these archives. So I decided to make, in, in, in the museum, I, I decided to reconnect the museum with the park school after 50, 60 years. And then I decide, and then I decide to, to make a short documentary named Memory Park, because I was interested in the memory of the, of the very young people, seven, ten, eight years old, that, that they were students there. And then I decide to, with the museum's uh, people that work with me, to to make to record their memory of them. How was the school in 1963, 64? What was happening inside this? Why it was so different? Why you become this, this person that you are now? And it was very interesting because when we arrived in the school, the directors, the majority of the teachers, everyone told me that the museum school was a social work. So everyone understood the history of this radical school as, oh, Anisio Teixeira created this school to help the poor black kid living in the suburbs of Salvador to have a profession and find a job. 
So this is, was the reading of the history. And then when we start to talk with the former students, first great thing, the former students, they never left the school, really. Because they are like 65, 70 years old, but they go to the school every day. And they go there because there's a theater there and they can dance. There's the library, they take a book. So I was also interested in why, what happened with these people? It's quite melancholic, but at the same time, it would be quite interesting to understand why. They have this so intense emotional connection uh, with the school. For them, it was never ever a social work. For them, it was, they, they start to tell me that they learned there essentially about life or essentially about how to have a healthy way of living in their experience that they have. In the opposite side, talking with the people, I, I became a friend of the Italian artist. He died two years ago, 85 years old. He was the first employee of the Museum of Modern Art. So Lina Bobard said, you go and work with me. And then I spent hours, hours, two years with him. And, and, and then he started to tell me, let's say, what was behind of this? What was behind this idea of this museum? Why, why the museum should be a totally, totally different museum and, and, and et cetera. And it was really interesting because in his vision, in his vision was a political revolutionary structure disguised as a museum. So for him it was a way of organize the revolution. And, and, she, and, 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 and he was an artist, a very amazing painting, by the way. And then he started to describe to me things that Lina said to him. Like, oh, we, we arrive in the morning to work, and then you have the blackboard uh, in the room, and then we found a multitude sentence there. Like, people need to organize themselves. So this is, was a bit the, 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 um, the main program of the museum. People should organize themselves concerning history, concerning art, and concerning economy. And also, the museum should work in a way that you should try to put it down any kind of a hierarchy. So it was the museum, it, it, it's the Museum of Modern Art of Bahia, but when the museum was created was at the same time the Museum of Modern Art and the, and the Museum of Popular Art arts and crafts. So she started to make exhibitions when she started to buy things that she found on the streets and put this next to a major Brazilian painter. Because for her, there was no kind of a hierarchy concerning creativity. And then, yeah, just to finish, there's this very symbolic uh, moment that when this woman came to Brazil and she, she wrote, yeah, you go, yeah, you're gonna like this story. So, and she, she's saying that she was walking in Rio de Janeiro with um, another immigrant. So she came from Italy and then she said that she was with some people from, some two guys from Austria, three guys from, from Germany and they were walking trying to know Rio de Janeiro and the whole atmosphere and etc. And then she said that they are just walking and there was a bar um, on the street and then suddenly a guy that was there sitting on the bar decided to, how you say this? When you, when you, when you, there's something in your mouth you just <laughs> split. And then, this, and then she said that this European crew started to, to walk and then suddenly this guy was totally 
and then he had to split this and then just go straight and um, uh, in the suit of this German recent immigrant. And then she wrote that this man became so, so disappointed and so sad because she understood this as a gesture of a place without any civilization. And she said that it was, that, was that moment that she decided to stay and not, and, not, and not to leave. Because she said, I'm interested in, in a place where things like that can happen. I'm interested in, in, in the idea that, that you can think about an organic way of organizing things, assuming that organic is positive and negative and it's not something only in your favor. But you don't have formal rules to dictate to you how things should be done. And then she said, so in this moment, I understood that in Brazil, you can find two aristocracies. The first one, the white, rich Brazilians came from the industrial um, part of the society and the coffee farms and the owners of the car farms, the coffee farms. This was the, f the first aristocracy. And they said the second aristocracy is, is the people, is the guy that was splitting on the streets. And I, and she wrote, I decide that I, I, I want to pay attention about what this aristocracy think what this aristocracy is imagining, or dreaming, or thinking about art, or thinking about education, and etc. So to finish, I, I think that Rudy has this amazing experience of working and being in contact with this aristocracy uh, uh, in the country. And, and now, as you know, I need to say, I need to tell this, Brazil is really in a bad, bad shape. And as you should know, um, but the one thing that the history of the country has teaching us, let's say, is the idea is the idea that good things can also happen. So even if even if if things sound so dark because you have a far-right government or you have um, authoritarian uh, positions taking society or, or things like that. Even so, you should believe that there was also, that there is a future, but you are in charge of reinventing this future as an institution, as an artist, as a curator, as a citizen, and, and etc. And as a, as a joke, you always say that all, all, all the blame, we should all put all the blame in Stephen Zweig that wrote this book, Brazil, the land of the future. Since then, we still believe that something fantastic is gonna happen there. Yeah, it was just that. Because uh, maybe instead of just continuing like this, we'll open this up right away because uh, maybe you have some some aspects you want to talk about or to pick up on or comment on. No, no, the museum is open. The museum is still there, but the museum the museum has given up once again to follow the original program. And, and the, so it's not a museum school anymore. It's just a museum with paintings on the wall. Yeah, this is, this is, this is interesting. Let's say, uh, comparing, comparing to, to, um, to the landscape of museums in Europe, I, I would say that in Bahia it's much more comfortable to go because it doesn't exist tickets. So if it's a public museum, uh, if it has public money on it, you, you cannot charge a ticket. Maybe it can sound crazy, but this is how things are. 
But as Ruth was saying, we have major problems. So we're not talking about only uh, my relationship with art or, or, or things like that, but you talk about, uh, really, really about very basic things, like you need to take a bus, public transport, go from platform to the museum, it's gonna take two hours of your time, and then you're gonna spend some money and to come in and go. So it's, it's a bit regulated by, by uh, some major circumstances, let's say, that I refuse it to, to, to go. In this, in, 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 in the case that Ruth was talking, was talking about this very specific place that was, let's say, closed by almost 20 years. That one, Watching. yeah, one of the, the, the more interesting projects made by Ina Bobadi in the 1980s in, in the city. I, I accept absolutely the real point about travel time, costs, these are very real things, but I think this is a this, I mean, this is also the same in my own city in London. It's also a question of class confidence. Actually, people, you know, young kids who are actually very confident in their own small areas, actually capable of shooting each other. And, but to go to a museum, they would actually be nervous. People are incredibly confident in their own. So I think there is a, f it's, it's more than, I mean, you know, that's very real, the two hour bus trip, having to pay for the, these are very real things, but I do think it's a thing about, yeah, I call it class confidence. Maybe it's also important to say, as you mentioned it twice, Ruth, that uh, the center of uh, Salvador is not uh, accessible. Uh, this is also due to, to culture. I mean, this became um, true when uh, Salvador became, you know, the old time town of Salvador became a, a cultural heritage site. So this is the moment when the big cleansing of this, you know, um, inner city started. So maybe it's also, you know, interesting to think about this relation. Yes, of course. I mean, the, um, the city of Bahia decided at one point that it, its best form of income would be tourism. And um, that was at the time when, when, when Brazil was part of the BRIC nation, and BRIC, BRIC nations, um, and the, there was actually an inner Brazilian tourism to Bahia, which completely stopped when this economic up was over. Um, so that actually was, while I was there, it was quite absurd because everything set up in the inner city like a Walt Disney way. So you have all the, all the facades painted very colorfully. When you look behind the facades, everything's crumbling. Um, uh, you can go on this one church, you can look from this church, from the back of the church, you can look at the back of the houses and you see that it's really it kind of uh, film, it's really a, a, a complete coulisse. It's like, um, what's the word? Uh, it's really a false surface um, that has been, um, it's not even gentrified, it's just a false surface. But the tourists are not there, except for Carnival, when the tourists are there. Um, but I think it's also because, uh, basically, if travel time is like that, you really need to have a reason to go. This has to maybe to do with class confidence, but it also has to do with what is your practice, what is your everyday practice. And if you have, um, if it takes you two hours to get there, and it also takes me two get hours to get from one place to another there is, so that's just what it takes to travel, then why would I do that unless I really have a reason? And if that's not something that you somehow learn as you're growing up, that there's a reason to go, then why go? And while you were doing the museum, um, and there were actually other practices practiced in the museum, then there was, were also other reasons to enter the museum again, like eating together or so. But this is also something that I'm really interested in in Germany, 
which I might not have made very clear with this first project, and one of the reasons why I'm interested in the museum and the school is that while you have this idea of cultural education in many European states, and which is actually a, a, an idea propagated by the state and also subsidized by the state, although not well subsidized, ideologically it's a quite a big thing that, um, um, and the reason the state is interested in cultural education is because they think it'll um, art and culture will somehow serve as the social cohesion that they need, whereas they're taking away other forms of social that would allow people to socially cohere, like um, welfare state or like having rights, having political rights. Do you see that in uh, in in Germany? And I've only researched this truly for Germany, but in G Germany you can see actually government papers that are saying that um, they want to, they want, they're subsidizing cultural education because they think that way migrants will integrate into German society. They are saying this in this blatant way. So, um, so there is this whole ideolo ideology about it, but at the point where this happens, and even in the most interesting projects that are happening in Germany, of people, cultural educators who are incredibly smart. It's still the case for many different reasons that what ends up being somehow, being the art that is in, in um, that is educated about, is, is edu that is somehow taught or used to mediate this process, is art that is deemed by not the people who think it's about life. It's not questioning the, the it, it's art that is deemed somehow understandable. So it's deemed, it's a very literal idea of what is um, being taught. So it's somehow something that is often very documentary or somehow something that is, um, that is supposed to be somehow close to the audience already as a work of art. And while I think that's fine, the two problems I have with that is it's a very top-down idea, and it's exactly not what you, we, you were talking about, which is an idea of art as life that is actually challenging authority, as is actually challenging the system. And at the same time, you have an even bigger gap with art that is somehow not to be deemed this kind of social art, uh, which is, remains a privilege of a few. So the, um, the, the museum, as, as John was rightly saying, is a space in which a certain kind of cultural privileges and, and authority and class authority is enacted, which is why it's uncomfortable to go there and also learn something unless the structures are changed. Um, and at the same time, it's this place where a certain kind of art that is also um, 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 much uh, more complex or difficult to understand and which might actually be useful to think about revolution, that might actually teach you something or allow you to think something differently, that remains uh, the privilege of a few. And that's why I want to bring this art out of this place and somewhere else. Yeah, I just want to add because mm, it was interesting. Uh, uh, because we are talking about uh, why, why the kids don't go to the museum there, and they said, but the kids are not going to museum in, in any place. Uh, they are forced to go. There's a different thing. So um, let's say the, 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 the audience, the museums, they are uh, decreasing. The art institutions, they are, they, are, um, they became like showrooms to put mild. So, um, but at the same time, everybody knows that this school, the way that the school is organized now, it doesn't work anymore. So you have two inst basic institutions in society, they are in crisis, in crisis of identity or in crisis of mission or, 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 or etc. So the question for, for us, let's say, is, how, how, how can it be possible to think about 
new possibilities, but not to change the name of things. And uh, I don't like this idea that let's not call this a museum because the museum is not trendy or the museum is not interesting or Kunsthalle doesn't work anymore. But how can you return to the idea of what a museum should be? So when you when you're thinking when you're showing your your image, I was thinking, okay, so this a this is a museum in the school, but what what so what a museum should should be? So the museum should have a should preserve something for the future to come. So if you if you go to this direction. What what should we preserve in the school for the future future to come? Is an object, is an idea, what can be? So, and then if you go on like this, what what could be another mission of the of the museum to to have a meaningful position in dialogue with your local community? So, how the school can have a meaningful <coughs> dialogue and position uh, uh, with their own community, and not to become a neutral environment or things like that. Uh, um, I, as a kid, I went to museums a lot alone, not with my parents. My sisters and I did. This is exactly because of privilege and education and so on. So I have the background where that was something that was even an option to do. But it was a huge experience. So I'm, when I'm thinking of museums, I'm thinking about that experience. So I'm not thinking from the institutional perspective, but from the ex perspective of someone who experiences as a kid. And what I cherish is not about the future at all. What I cherish is actually about the past and is about um, timing. At exactly what a lot of people really hate about the museum, that it's so old and dusty and actually not, um, not with the times or so, is what I as a kid really liked because it gave me a lot of time. So I had this feeling I could be in this space and it gave me a lot of time. And there was something really interesting and the artist Martha Ros Rosler once said to, um, you know, she's of this generation who was in the 80s, of course, criticizing the institution of museum. Um, but then um, 2009, she, she and I shared a, a panel at a symposium and she said, that she thinks it's one of the few public spaces left where you can have a critical discourse. So while we might still criticize the museum for many, many things, in, in present day, you have a situation where you, you can have a critical reflection, where you can have maybe an idea of a be visible as a member of the public in this very traditional Habermasian way. Where you have, um, where you also have this possibility to interact with an artwork more than once, and this is what I find extremely important because, basically, when you go and see an artwork more than once, it speaks to you in a different way because you are also in a different position every time you go see, see it. And this kind of conversation, which is not immediate one, but it is one of experience and is one of viewership is one that I think, me personally, I learned so much from that. And that is something that I, um, I think only museums can do. And actually exhibitions like Documenta, or even if they're long, cannot do. Even though Documenta, for instance, has this ambition to be a museum for 100 days. And exactly this is a kind of difference to other biennales that it thinks like this. Um, so for me, that's the thing that I want to keep, but I want to try to, and this is something that I think that every good kid should have the possibility of experiencing. This exactly engagement with an art object, but also this engagement, this being in a, um, this viewership as a public act mm -hmm. in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, um, you told us about, or you mentioned the painter, the Italian painter who was um, at the museum working for quite a long time. So I will, I'm curious about what was he doing there and how long he was staying at the museum 
And what was the idea of Lina Bobadi to ask him or to appoint him to be there uh, as somebody? Very, yeah. his, um, his name was uh, Sandy Scaldafei. Um, he was he was really part of the major moments of, of uh, Brazilian culture. Uh, he was one of best friends of Glauber Rocha, the move director. He he was uh, came from a very rich family that was in tr in the trade of the cacao and and, and market and, and and things like that. So he was uh, Lina Bobad has decided to have him as her um, right arm, let's say, and because they could speak Italian. <laughs> <laughs> it was very, very simple. Uh, they could speak Italian, and and he was very young, and and a very, and a quite quite talented person. So yeah, it was uh, like a uh, place like this. He stayed, his until yeah, because this how the museum school found its end, how the project was finished. The project was finished in 1964, and when the, the, the dictatorship came. So the first thing that the army decided to do was to close every school inside the museum, but not the exhibition. The exhibition was not dangerous, but the schools or the, or the projects concerning the community of the city they understood this as a quite dangerous thing. So, and they and they and they, they made something very very mm, perverse. Lina left the museum. He left the museum, and they they made an exhibition inside the museum. The army. It was an exhibition to show the dangers of the leftist terrorists. So it was a propaganda, uh, uh, an, uh, an exhibition. Uh, yeah, so it finished in 64. And then I came there in, in 2012, and the project was trying to, to reconnect it with the original program. And then the, the, and then, and then the museum school has uh, finished once again uh, after a, a putsch in Brazil. So the history went uh, 50 years after it happened again. Uh, not the same way, but quite similar. But I just want to address two things that, that uh, Ruth said about the experience in the museum. The first one that I need to confess something, because you're saying that you went as a kid, you went to the museum, that was very interesting. The first museum that I went to my life was the Lina Bobardi Museum in Sao, in Sao Paulo. And I went there, I put my finger in a Van Gogh. Because I was so, I don't know, hypnotized. I saw that it was... And, and Lina organized the museum in a way that there is no this kind of a safe, classical environment. The museum. So I went there, and, 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 and nobody died. The painting is still there, and, 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 and things like that. Let's say, what we can do or what's possible to do? Because we're talking about a lot about things like mm, art in life. Oh, this is a very uh, avant-garde uh, theory uh, uh, and, and about it. So how how can you make this reconnection and 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 and, and, and things like that? But there's one thing that I have been thinking since since the I started to work in Germany and, and and in this new institution that we need to learn to 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 fail again. Yes. So uh, the museum is not the museum became or, or the artistic institution became a place where this idea of the Failure start to disappear. 
So it means that if you're not, if the, the failure is not happening, it means that you're not trying. It means that you are in a very strong position of promoting a kind of a repetition. So you are repeating models, you are repeating structures, but you, but you, you are in a position that you are maybe you are not paying attention or listening to issues around you or, 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 or around the institution. You are much more free than I, in the sense that my problem, I could not say my passion, but my problem is the museum as an institution, let's say. Uh, my problem is, is, is much more to understand and why this institution became the way that the institution is now. But I was not this I want to talk, the, because it's just a very small thing, because you said that the museum is one of the less public spaces or social spaces and etc. And if you look back in the history of the museum as an institution, in the 19th century, the museum was, in Europe, the museum was a high sexual place. Because it was the only place that a man could talk to a woman um, with the mother of the father or the man around her was distracted. So there was this high sexual tension in the museums uh, uh, of Europe. So the idea that the little lady sitting there looking to this nude uh, of Renoir, and then came the guy behind and say something like, you are very gracious. So it was, so this idea of the social uh, aspect of, of, of the museum is interesting because it's there since, since the beginning. The question is, what has been lost in this process? Um, for me, a very banal precondition for all that would be to get rid of this uh, entrance fees, for example. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous uh, how much it costs and, you know, to go repeatedly to an exhibition. It's almost impossible, yes? And the other thing is, you know, I, I hear that a lot, that uh, museums are the last um, public space to talk about revolutionary ideas and so on. I can't see that. And I see a lot of exhibitions who fail, by the way. Most of the exhibitions I see fail in a very uninteresting way, and it's probably not what you mean. Uh, they, they fail by repeating, you know, the same failure over and over again. But, you know, I can't see a museum in our societies to work as a social space, not as the conditions are. And, you know, uh, furthermore, I see a lot of social spaces developing, you know, which are maybe not so visible, which are, you know, maybe visited only by a few people, but, you know, the museum yeah, well, is dead for me as an institution. Because so many things seem, you know, you have to protect the art, you have a collection, you need, you know, a room temperature, you can't eat, you can't smoke, you can't, you know, you can't do anything. You can't scream, you can't kiss, you can't yeah. whisper in the ear of your beloved. Well, this you can maybe, but, you know, uh, it's, you're very limited in what you can do. Yeah, but it could still be imagined differently, huh? And also, well, I, I mean, in terms of Ma what Martha said, that was, because I was talking retrospectively, what Martha said was in more than 10 years ago, and a lot has changed even since then. So I would agree with you on, on, on a lot of things. It's both in terms of um, that is not necessarily anymore the public space, but also in terms of other places that are that are starting, that are interesting. But um, but then maybe it comes to something that we haven't really talked very much about this evening, and that is also that is about the art, because basically where else would you be seeing the art? 
And if you're interested in that art, how else would you give access that is somehow an access where people can also interact and as a kind of diversity and not as a kind of homogeneity? And so um, I agree with you that it's not working, but I don't think that it, it's necessarily institutionally preconditioned that it can't work. I think it's not working because of the way that the art business or art world is, is organized at the moment, which is a really perverse form of capitalist organization. I think it actually never worked. The very structure of, you know, the buildings, if you look at them, uh, the stairways... I've had wonderful were... six at the Victoria and Albert Museum, so I don't agree with you. <laughs> Uh, yes, you are an example to us all, but <laughs> I think it never, you know, I mean, this, you know, a lot of this, if you just look at the, at the architecture, it's so authoritarian in a way, if you look at historical ones, but also if you look at contemporary ones. So already, you know, another precondition is not there to make it you know, in the community space. I mean, you know, uh, Lina's um, work is exceptional in this matter, but you know, she's one of the very rare examples. Yeah, and but it's important to take these examples seriously, and I think you can find more than just Lina's. I mean, I, I, um, there are other problems with non-authoritarian museums that one might criticize, for instance, Louisiana, the museum, is an amazing museum. It has, you could then criticize that one for enacting a kind of um, clean version of democracy, where you, you know, there are other criticisms you can have, but that's a question of any kind of institution ever. Um, but I think there are, even in Europe, um, spaces that work, and I also don't even agree with you fully on this question of um, author authoritarian um, architecture because I think that it's not just about the structure of the buildings, it's also about the practice of space that these buildings are attacked to. It's the it's same as you know when people are criticizing technology, it's about a kind of social use of technology which also then feeds back onto what technology can do or not. And I would say the same about these spaces. Yes, there might be spaces like the Art um, Kunsthistorische Museum that are constructed with a certain way of, of authority in mind and taxonomy in this case. But then if you compare how this Secondaire gallery used to function, and now you have a cafe, you can already see a difference, and that difference is relevant. So I think that uh, we're also not talking about absolutes, but I don't know if you, you probably most people in the room still remember the Secondaire gallery. It was an amazing space. It was where they then they cut this because they want to make earn, have revenue, so they have a cafe and all these things that they instituted, but was the, was on the second floor, the whole second floor, and it was the works that were deemed not so canonical. And it was even there, there was something that was like subversive from the inside out in this idea, you know, to display these two, you know, to, to, to display these works that are deemed not so canonical. And um, so I would say that the change between when I, when Secondaire Gallery was still there and now is a relevance change. And it's also a change in, um, in degrees. So this is not just about the ideal museum of Lina Bobaci in the 50s, end of 50s, and the terrible situation we have now, or you know, things always being authoritarian or not. It's about these degrees, I think. I just want to tell something about the ticket. Um, I do, I'm not an art historian, so I don't know what they are teaching nowadays. Um, but I always think it's quite important to have a larger understanding. Every institution is 
somehow a kind of a consequence of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So um, it was created in 1930, 31, yeah, maybe. So the idea that this idea that you have the first museum from the contemporary art, and then you have everything that we know already about this. And, and, and the MoMA is still, until now, is pictured as a kind of uh, this place that we, we should arrive at in that place. It's a kind of model, and etc. And then we, and then we can, if you took took a look in the history of the MoMA, you could address all the issues that you are talking here, like the architecture and etc. And the, let's say, the reinvention of a certain narrative concerning art history and so on. But there is also the ticket, because. And this is interesting because the MoMA didn't have a ticket in the beginning. So um, the MoMA was also a place for, let's say, the free space that where everyone can go. And then this has changed after, if I remember well, two years after the inauguration of the MoMA. And why? Because Nelson Rockefeller came and, 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 and took the power in the committee of the, the museum. And then Rockefeller started to, to convince the, 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 the board of the museum that the museum should be, should be organized as a business. So, and then Rockefeller came with the idea of the ticket. That should be, that should be charged and et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes I have the impression that we and, and this is normal. We 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 think that the the, the problems they are hap start to happen twenty years ago or thirty years ago. But there's some some we are we are part of a, a consequence of some decisions that were taken. So it's not only the ticket, but the meaning of the ticket. So in the sense. An institution should 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 bring revenues. An institution should should operate following this system as an, an enterprise. Let's say the question is that the society became like this, and not only the museum. So how, yeah, with the exception of so Soviet Union, but this is another history. So, but how how can you? Turn around this issue when, when, when uh, concerning, let's say, we are talking about the authoritarian presence of the of the museum in society, but the society became authoritarian. So how how you gonna how it's possible to expect that this place is gonna be less authoritarian? I, I, I'm not saying it's not possible. It's really a question. I really, I really, I really don't know. It's just that. Thank you. I have a lot in my mind. I don't know where to start. <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation, even though uh, I came late. Um, I'm not a fan of museums, um, but I'm, I'm, I, can, I can live with it. <laughs> I can negotiate with it. But the whole idea of museum to me is, as we all know, um, if we navigate the recent history, how the museums are created to to show some, you know, uh, antiques uh, uh, collected from, you know, the from the colonies, and those um, uh, antiques related to anthropology or all, all, all those uh, I mean materials were uh, uh, kind of. Uh, has some kind of you know power relation to it, uh, the the structure of the museum itself historically. Um, and what I wanted to say is um, we are we are talking about art and accessibility of the museum, but I think uh, we jumped the artist in between. <laughs> so how are the museum space accessible to the artist? 
and uh, especially uh, I, I can I can speak from my context, my, my from my, my country context. Uh, museums are more most related to what uh, the state wants to narrate through the museums, or the the hegemonic uh, narrations of what the state should look like. If you go to different museums, so when you step in the museum and having this this is by the way I like the idea of um, uh, having active school or radical. Um, activity in the knowledge production process, but at the same time, uh, when you take this kind of uh, activities to the museum, how are you, were you also concerned about uh, the artworks being produced there and also uh, displayed in the museum? Because uh, as an artist, and also museums are not that easy to be accessible for any artist. Um, you should be, I mean, affiliated with some kind of power or some kind of political, you know, agenda to be uh, to show your artwork in the in the museum. So uh, I also want to talk about the contemporary artists. In uh, last year, I was in the Venice Biennale, uh, so I was looking at the the pavilions, and so I found the 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 whole exhibition. Uh, like as a replica of what's happening in this capitalist world, to to be honest. So when you go to it's really like a, a replica of what's happening in this like world, than uh, like being critical, being a critical space. Mm -hmm. So if you go to, for example, a German pavilion or you know the uh, British uh, pavilion, you can you can tell, you know, from the the structure and from the material they used, the installations, and how much money spent on it. Mm -hmm. And then if you, if you go to, for example, I saw the Kenyan pavilion, which was really, really a neglect, neglected and a, a very, um, uh, I mean, I don't know. The space was in an elementary school. It was very hard to find it. We, we had a hard time to find it. And once we get to the space, it was not, the artworks were, not, one of the artworks were even falling. And I mean, uh, so what's different about uh, being an artist and, and being imaginative and creative and, and reflective to what's happening in this you know, uh, world? And, and I'm not saying that the artists should have a responsibility to, to solve all the problems, but at least I think we need to see something different about, uh, it should be a critical space at least, if, if, if uh, we're talking about um, I mean, art and the museums or artists. So, where can you locate the artists in between this accessibility of the museum and and making it a radical space for knowledge production and and also some kind of social uh, activities, a space to make it more of a space of social activities. So, it should be uh, also first accessible to the artist, to me, so that we can see. Uh, lots and lots of ideas that doesn't uh, get uh, a space to to know, to communicate or to also to I mean at least to to discuss with the society. Also, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> I'm really tired. I think it all, I think it all makes sense. Um, but what 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 for me also I can't see your face, which is a bit difficult. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but what this make draw, uh, make clear to me also that is of course it's a, a bit problematic how we're discussing about the museum as if this was just one homogeneous practice. Um, Venice is an atrocity, I think. It's not just on this level of that you were describing, but even the supposedly rich, um, rich exhibitions are made on the backs of many, many people, including the ones that are supposedly privileged, like the artist or the curator. It's, and it's always like that, and it, it's, a, it's a kind of fiction that people do who are willing to self-exploit because they think it'll somehow, they will gain something from it, symbolic capital or whatever, visibility. And then everyone um, who's participating actually agrees to upheld this fiction, which 
forces everyone, which is the, the fiction of the art world, you know, that this is even possible to produce works like this. With It's, it's, it's really an atrocity. Every, everyone who's ever done it has has told me about this, you know, horrible background stories of how this is produced um, with, with much less money, with, you know, the power relations are quite open in this. The other thing is this question of the National Museum um, and this, the way that there's, the museum is a kind of um, uh, um, tool of the state in building kind of nationhood and also disciplining as, or building a, you know, visualizing the citizenship and so on. This again is a very twofold thing. I don't know if, you know, if you know this film by Naim Mohamim, oh Mohamim, about the kind of museums that were built or spaces that were built during the um, um, non-alignment movement, uh, when you have um, a kind of ambition to self-represent. So this is like, who gets to decide what is the state and who gets to decide what is the nation? And in places where there's no museum infrastructure, there are many people who are actually quite active in society who are um, on the left or whatever, who are, who are saying, you know, trying to make a structure like that. So there's different, but then you have something like Singapore Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art, I don't know the real title of it, which has for the past, with a lot of money, for the past few years, um, decided to, you know, collect it from all over Southeast Asian nations. They've got the, like, the main works of other countries because the other countries don't have national museums and the politicians have decided that culture is somewhat not important. So that has allowed Singapore with a lot of money to get all this. And it goes it goes so far, it, they even have Viet Cong posters on display in this most capitalist place of all. And um, there you have this again, like Venice really open, how um, that it, this is a project that has to do with power in the region that really doesn't care about Europe at all. You know, really is about having this power. And if, if you know how Singapore functions economically and in relation to Malaysia and Indonesia and exploiting labor in these places, there is a relation again, which, so I would agree with you in that. But I think that, um, that these are examples, but that we have to, you know, it's very, we opened this Pandora's box but I think it's almost uh, problematic to generalize in this way. Yeah. Do you want to say something about the role of the artist? Uh, not exactly. <laughs> but I just like I just think that it, about what you, what you said about just two things that could be interesting to to have in mind. So and. The first one is when you talk about museums, you talk about what exactly. So we are talking about this um, official uh, uh, structure uh, made by the state or made by uh, a collector, a billionaire, and etc. Or or we, or we talk about an idea or talk about uh, a mental and material organization that has a meaning and a goal. So it's interesting because if not, you, you, you in, in, in the discussions, it's natural. There's nothing natural. There's usual, it's usually, uh, you, we take some ready-made ideas without even the notings that we are taking these ideas because you're so used to thinking that the museum is this, that the museum can be so many different things, like the museum in yeah in Salvador uh, by yeah. This is the, the first point. This, I think it's interesting to have this in mind. And the second one is also a conceptual question that when you when you talk a lot about criticality or critical point of view or critical action, but once again. Um, to be critical 
means exactly what. So, what I'm saying is maybe it's necessary to have a, a definition of criticality or critical procedure or a cri a, 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 um, an exhibition that has a critical point of view, but we need to, maybe it could be interesting to ask ourselves what exactly critical means. It means that if you make an exhibition that's going to illustrate in this space the problems of the world, this is, means that we are critical. Um, so, just to, just a matter of example, asking these questions to myself, to myself, yeah, of course. Criticality being critical, I was mentioning earlier that you, an artist doesn't have an obligation, you know, to to solve the world or to put out, you know, um, those, you know, questions on behalf of, you know, <laughs> everybody, but because you guys were talking about accessibility of the, the space and to intervene in a museum and make it more, you know? Um, so I, I, I have a feeling that uh, if we are like talking about art and a museum, a, a space to show an art, so where is the artist? That, that was my, my, my question. But, um, and I'm not also being pessimist, but we also have to see uh, things critically. It's not only about uh, the, I just brought the Venice Biennale as an example, but I think we should be also conscious of what's happening around us and also uh, people who are also more close to um, uh, this exhibition or uh, um, museums or curating, could be curating or producing an artwork. So I'm just reflecting on that. So I don't see a, a kind of uh, like a, a balanced way of doing things in general. So I'm not, I don't like generalizing things, but uh, this is just a, a comment. And I, I don't feel, for example, welcomed to, to that space. For example, I, I just forget my artist background, but as an individual, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel right to me to see those kind of like, you know, unbalanced way of doing things. It could be an art, it could be whatever. That's, that's how I wanted to see it, but, but we can also uh, talk a lot about what, what it means to be critical or criticality. Or what. I understand your point. But then also yeah. you'd have to ask yourself, you know, what is an artist? Yeah. Uh, because, of course, um, one definition could be an artist is someone who uh, is an, an able to, to or enables herself to or they, themselves um, to take a position of subjectivity, of artistic subjectivity. And the museum is one of these instruments to produce this position. So a lot of artistic subjectivity is exactly produced in the system, which is actually a system of power. So that you suddenly have actually artists appear very big in museums as names, for instance. Um, and other practices that might be, maybe are not about the artist vanishing. So there, you know, there's, it's quite complex on all these. I think you're, you're driving a, a really important point. Um, I think that the language to do so needs to be a bit more complicated in, um, yeah, because which artist do we want to have the power in a museum. There's, there again, there are a certain number of artists I don't want to see have a power in a museum. I'm really happy if they don't, if just their artworks are there. You know what I, I mean? Don't want, I don't want anyone, I mean, especially an artist, to have a power. I mean, this one yeah. already has the power. We're just yeah. every day dealing with it. Huh? Yeah. So it's not about yeah. having a power like to say something. It's like an urgency to say something, but. When you, when you produce your, I mean, when you come up with your project, you are being critical at some point, right? Critical of the space in the museum. And, if, and you're also thinking of an alternative mechanism, how to deal with the museum, right? So I think to me, that's looking at critically your environment. 
maybe you are close to the practice of art, so you do it that way. Maybe some other people do it differently. No, th that's that's uh, uh, my point. But I don't I don't want again to bring a power relation. I don't want the artist uh, to go there, and I want to have a power so that I can you know dictate things. But I think everybody has a power by itself as as a natural being. So I mean. So I, th I think it's uh, the 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 problem is how we deal and how we communicate and how we interact to each other using those powers or those energies, and and that's that's my point. So I mean, I don't know uh, actually what art is and what an artist is actually. Yeah, just just to clarify one one thing when I talk about. Criticism, or critical point of view. So, there's a definition about about a critical point of view, a critical process. That I don't know. For me, it makes a lot of sense. It it helped me to 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 think. Let's say, and this is very old indeed. This is this is Walter Benjamin from the 1920s, and that be critical is is the possibility that you can think about the process that you are in. If you are not able to think about the process that you are in, you're not being critical, or you're not in a critical position, let's say. And, and he came with this idea because he, he, he moved to, he was traveling to Moscow. And then he, he, he found in the newspapers workers talking about the daily routine as a workers in the critical point of view, meaning what was my experience in the factory? So what, how much energy or how much thirsty I spend my day or things like that. So he, he was thinking about this idea that this person can criticize the process that this person is in. If you take this as a perspective, then comes a very interesting question. If an artist is making or intent that this piece should be seen by someone, also can say no, I'm not interested that nobody can see this. Is this process of seeing a critical process? So it means you are putting this viewer in, in, a, in a position of being really a critic, meaning he can think about the process that he's, in, that he's part of it somehow. And, and, I'm, and, and I'm not criticize about what you're saying, because what we are saying is, let's say, our doubts here too. That's the reason that you don't have answers. I'm just thinking about how, as Ruth was saying, how we can return to some, to our own discourse and try to, to, to understand once again of the meaning of these concepts that we are using all the time, and sometimes without a proper, a proper dis distance, let's say. So, yeah, so everybody wants to have a radical museum, everybody wants to have uh, critical exhibitions, everybody wants to have artists, and then ask what is radical, what's critical, and what's a museum, so. Maybe this is a good, good, Last sentence. <laughs> I think it was a final statement and very nice to, to end with Walter Benjamin and his ideas about reflecting and criticality. So I thank you for your talk, very nice, and for all the comments and questions asked here. And so, we have to be critical and uh, as you uh, said, uh, we have to realize maybe our failures and be uh, conscious about this too. Thank you a lot. Thank you.